My goal is to sort of frame the issue of infection. I, I think we all um, worry about infection. I think we have patients in whom we specifically worry about infection. And what can you do in those individuals? Is it safe? Um, take a line from a Dustin Hoffman movie from a long time ago. So uh, there's a lot of biologics out there. I mean, for pretty much all the diseases that we manage, and this is a revolutionizing our therapies. Um, quite interestingly, the uh, unifying concern on all of these is uh, the issue of infection, especially serious infectious events. And uh, the question really is, how can one um, do no harm? That is really our greatest concern. So uh, I would, I think, sort of summarize in the beginning by saying you need to identify high-risk individuals, because that is your may maybe your most important step in avoiding uh, in in uh, infection. And then um, mortality uh, related to infection, which is, again, one of our big, biggest concerns, especially with rheumatoid arthritis. This really begins with careful patient selection, uh, with prudent drug use, and then a risk reduction strategy. When it comes to prudent drug use, again, there is no situation where you cannot use these ma medicines. Even pregnancy, I mean, some of you think it's contraindicated. It's not contraindicated. All the package inserts for pretty much all the biologics have this line in there that says that the drug should only be used uh, during pregnancy only if clearly needed. So you wouldn't use a biologic unless it was clearly needed. And if you have an, or an alternative, use it, because whether it's pregnancy or someone who's not pregnant, you, know, you want to use the best drug for that patient. Um, so again, these drugs are on the table. The question is who you shouldn't use them in. So the bottom line when it comes to infectious risk, this is always uh, my summary slide, that I think we need to just keep remembering, because when our patients die of infection, we always blame it on the drug. Uh, RA activity, inflammatory load and debility is the single biggest predictor for an infectious risk. Um, the risk is augmented by, as Xavier pointed out, steroid use. Un uniformly, almost every study, almost every disease, maybe almost any dose. Um, comorbidities are a major factor we know, but I think we uh, forget or don't uh, recognize the risk of chronic lung disease. Chronic lung disease is probably the major thing because pneumonia is the number one cause of infectious death in rheumatoid arthritis. Chronic lung disease of any kind, whether it's BOOP, ILD, COPD, whatever, is a big risk factor. Age is an increasing risk factor. Major surgery because you open up the skin, your number one defense mechanism against infection. Use of cytotoxics. And something well known in the ID literature, not well appreciated by rheumatologists, is a prior SIE, like pneumonia, septic arthritis, meningitis, is likely to occur again. And the second time around, it's likely to kill you. So if you have someone who has a real history of pneumonia, not like double walking pneumonia treated with amoxicillin for three days. I don't know what that is in the, you know, in the community. But they were hospitalized and on a vent and that sort of thing. That's a real risky patient when it comes to using a biologic in the future. So you have to have a high index of suspicion. This is a, an old slide from this um, conference that I've resurrected and actually changed some of the boxes. But what you can take away, NSIE means non-serious infectious events, SIE, serious infectious events, um, that f across the board, those are really increased in all the clinical trials. The things that are specific to each drug are fairly shown. One, that TNF inhibitors have a wide array of infectious risks may be the greatest, and that needs to be considered. That anakinra is probably quite safe, all, and maybe make the same jump to the other IL-1 inhibitors. Abatastor doesn't seem to have very much. Rituximab has the unique risk of serious viral infections, and PML being the worst amongst them. Tocilizumab, nothing special, but tofacitinib does have a standout with a much higher rate of zoster compared to the other agents. So these need to be kept in mind. So this is the, 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 the nine biologics currently approved for rheumatoid arthritis. I don't consider atofacitinib a biologic, but often it wants to get discussed in these sort of um, uh, topic discussions. Um, and the uniform feature of all these biologics is that when you look at the, the package insert data, the clinical trial data in drug development, you know, RA only, inflammatory RA only, no comorbidities, not real world, that there's a doubling of the rate. And by the way, that's a non-significant doubling. So from the clinical trials, you'd really have to say that SIEs are not clinically increased or significantly increased statistically. Is that meaningful? Well, from 1% to 2% with the use of a drug, it's up to you. But when I asked you which, if I asked you which of these drugs is the safest to use or doesn't have an increased risk compared to placebo, there's actually two based on the data. That's etanercept at 1% apiece and golimumab. 
So again, that's the data that's out there, but the uniform uh, risk to using a biologic seems to be consistent. It seems to be a small but significant risk. It may double your risk, okay? So you need to know basically what your baseline risk is going in. This is another way of showing this data that just like Xavier showed from the Cochrane analysis, this is actually from uh, Vivica and coworkers who actually did a meta-analysis of all the studies out there. And what you need to know is the, uh, the goalposts here on SIEs is the number of three to nine per 100 patient years. And these are the rates that are seen in the, in the development trials and existing trials that are out there for all these drugs, including tofacitinib, and they're all falling within the expected rate. Again, underscoring the fact that they're probably not a major increase in infection when you're looking at RA patients with inflammatory disease only. Um, this is data from the, the AIR registry from Xavier's group uh, where they actually studied rituximab, and you can see that between the first cycle and second cycle, not a lot of difference as far as the in infection rates over time. The SIE rates was five per 100 patient years, and 50% occurred within the first three months. The predictors of these events, this is very consistent across a lot of trials, and especially this trial, chronic lung disease, cardiac insufficiency, extra-articular manifestations, and being hypogammaglobulinemic before receiving rituximab. So the idea is that there are some things that you have to worry about as baseline risk. Um, this is just more on rituximab, which I think everyone wants to know. Do I do IgG levels or not? The data from, uh, this, as reported by Ron van Vollenhofen, from the drug development experience with rituximab, 3,100 patients followed for up to 10 years, receiving, I think, up to I think it was 15 or 19, it was the most number of courses that someone had received, but I, you know, not, not, most of them around 10. And they looked at uh, those patients who had either low IgG or low IgM during the trial for at least four months or two consecutive visits, and they looked at the SIE, SIE rates based on what uh, happened. And you can see here, IgM levels didn't predict very well the uh, uh, infection rate. And by the way, these infection rates are very low, uh, roughly around three to four per 100 patient years. But IgG seemed to make some sense, but then does it make sense? If you never had a low IgG, this is before you got um, um, rituximab, your rates were low, but both before you receive rituximab and after receiving rituximab, if your IgG went low, now you have a higher rate. So that means if you're doing IgG levels beforehand and they're low, um, what does that mean to you? Well, it may mean that they may be at higher risk, but it doesn't go, but if it comes on when they are on the drug that they, that they also can get a higher risk of infections, it, again, I, I don't see the value myself in, in following these. I, there are people, I, I seem to, when, when I talk to Bing Bingham and Artie Cavanaugh, allergy trained rheumatologists, which makes them smarter than me on these topics, they usually like to look at IgG levels. Most clinical rheumatologists don't look at this until they're like well into their fourth, fifth, tenth course of rituximab, and now they're concerned because, you know, rituximab just goes after CD20 positive B cells. It doesn't deplete tissue plasma cells, which are making these immunoglobulins, but at some point they must, they may, and we just don't know how, at what point that is. So again, when the, the, there are patients in whom I do follow these levels, but if you're going to follow something, IgG may be of some value in some patients. Um, patients who are at risk, this is a, these are three studies mandated by the FDA with the first three TNF inhibitors that said, let's study patients who have comorbidities, heart failure, diabetes, uh, lung disease, and to get in this trial you had to have a comorbidity and you had to be on a DMARD and be a non-responder and you either received uh, placebo or TNF inhibitors and there was no increase in the SIE rate in these uh, four to six month trials, with the exception of the adalimumab start trial, where those who got the very high dose of infliximab, 10 milligrams per kilogram, did have a significant increase. So generally using generally accepted uh, therapies, even patients with one risk factor are, is not in itself enough to make a higher risk of SIE. You probably need multiple risk factors, as I'm going to show you, as actually Xavier showed you. So what are the big factors, um, aside from background comorbidity and age and steroids. Well, this comes from the BSRBR, which shows, I think, quite clearly, it's actually not the drug, it's the disease activity. So whether you're on a DMR or any Tanercept, as you increase disease activity, so do you increase your risk of infection. And this is the same slide that was shown earlier, I think a masterful slide and, and has tremendous teaching value, which looks at patients. If you just look at the front row and you increase the rate of the, the dose of steroids, less than uh, 7.5, 7.5 to 15, greater than 15, there's not a lot of difference between the, those that are receiving DMARTs and TNF inhibitors. 
But it's only when you start to pile on the other risk factors, the other high risk factors of age, chronic lung disease, chronic renal disease, number of, uh, uh, of prior treatment failures, that you now start to see that the addition of a TNF inhibitor, a biologic, significantly alters the risk. This becomes the basis for that um, um, the, the, the rabbit risk score, which is, this is now th that score in play. So again, the risk score, as they use it, is based on age, pred uh, prednisone dose, number of prior DMARs, prior SIEs, current biologics. And you can see uh, patient number one is a 47-year-old woman who has no comorbidities, two prior DMARs. Um, she has three tender, three swollen joints, a hack of 0.5. She takes methotrexate and prednisone, 10 milligrams per day. Her SIE risk is 1.4%. If you put her on a TNF inhibitor, it now doubles to 2.6%. This is a scenario we commonly do use, but we don't necessarily know the numbers. Another scenario that we would commonly use a biologic would be a 62-year-old woman with COPD and a prior history of pneumonia. She's failed six prior DMARDs and or biologics, she now has six and six tender and swollen. Her hack is a little higher at 1.2, and she's taking leflunamide and 15 milligrams of prednisone. Her constitutive risk with that profile is 28% for an SIE within the next year. The next year, she's gonna be hospitalized with a pneumonia. Now, if you give her a TNF inhibitor, or if you give her tocilizumab or abatacept, it doubles, and in this case of a TNF inhibitor, it goes to 45%. If you put in the other drugs, you'll get a different number, but it'll be like 42 or 46 or 49. But you see what happens here. There are patients where you're really out on a limb, and this is the sort of profile that you need to be thinking about and looking at when considering infection. So the recipe for infection, the pathways by which you get there are pretty clear to me, and that is the higher the inflammatory load, the greater risk. Um, debility adds that significantly. Steroids are major bad guys in this, in, in this pie. Um, TNF inhibitors could be, but it's, I think it's the, t it's, it's, the, it's the steroids. By the way, the evidence that DMARDs increase risk is scant to none, with the exception of cytotoxics and cyclosporin. Okay? Prior SIEs, again, if you had a pneumonia, you're going to get one again, and then surgery is a risk factor. So surgery always comes up as, a, as an issue of risk and how do we handle it. This is my take home. I can, I can, if you read the fine print on the bottom, this is a conglomeration of about seven or eight really bad studies done by orthopedists um, who don't know how to add, to, and they're, now they're doing pu publications. So, um, but nonetheless, there really is some valuable data out there. It's just not great. It's hard to come by this data. This, the risk of a surgical site infection seems to be higher when, using on, when you're on a TNF inhibitor. The risk seems to be greatest um, when you're starting the drug uh, and when you've washed out the drug, meaning when the patient now starts to flare and have a greater amount of inflammation, which drives risk. So number one, do not do surgery at peak drug levels, like right after, if they had infliximab on Monday, don't do surgery on Thursday. Number two, um, do not do surgery after they have been washed out. If they're washed out um, beyond their four or five half-lives of the drug, then now they run the risk of actually uh, flaring uh, and, and, and driving that infection risk. And the prudent policy would be to suspend the drug for one dosing interval. So one week for etanercept, two to four weeks for adalimumab, four to eight weeks for infliximab, so on and so forth. This seems to make the most amount of sense. This is actually supported by a publication from a, a two, three years ago at the at, I think at ULAR. This is an eight-year um, study of 50,000 orthopedic procedures in 37,000 patients, most of whom had osteoarthritis, but they compared inflammatory and osteoarthritis and showed that patients who have inflammatory disease who are on a TNF inhibitor um, at the, the table, the bottom uh, right box, uh, 6.9 relative risk for, thank you very much, for developing a, a serious infectious event. And what they showed in their study, if you dosed the, the, T, the TNF inhibitor within one dosing interval, if you did the surgery within one dosing interval, you had a tenfold increased risk of having an SIE or a surgical site infection. So the idea is suspend the drug for at least one dosing interval. So what about viral infections? I think we've heard some about viral infections already yesterday, some great lectures. Um, what about nonsense infections like uh, influenza and UTI? Yes, they are up in RA patients over controls, not necessarily driven by the therapies we use, so that's important to note. Um, UTI risk is a twofold increased risk of, amongst RA patients for UTI, and again, it's probably related to steroid use, um, and, and not necessarily to DMARDs, um, but nonetheless, that data is out there, although it's somewhat weak. 
I believe with the, if you look at all the zoster data that's out there, that there is an increased risk of herpes zoster in patients who receive TNF inhibitors. It really depends on who you're comparing the, 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 the biologic treated patient to, um, uh, to get whether, whether it's up or down. But most of these studies, very large cohorts, seem to show uh, hazard ratios greater than one. And I think that we therefore need to have a smart strategy, which was gone over in great detail yesterday. Hepatitis B, something that Lenny should be lecturing about because he's like the world expert on this. Um, we know that what IBD patients may be at higher risk, uh, but our RA patients, there's, as far as a population risk, our RA patients are not at higher risk for hepatitis B, but nonetheless, it is something we should be um, screening for prior to initiating a biologic, especially in, in RA. And, and now you can categorize your patients um, based on what their risk is. There's those who have the, the highest risk and those who have the lowest risk. Um, and patients who ha are, have the highest risk are those who are actively infected and are hepatitis B surface antigen positive. Um, those that are lowest risk would be those who are hepatitis B surface antigen negative but are core antibody positive. Actually, lowest risk could be all test negative, obviously. Um, but there is this cohort of resolved hepatitis B that has B surface antigen negative and core antibody positive. Um, and if they are patients who have normal LFTs and no viral DNA, that may be a population whom you can use a biologic in certain situations. So in that particular population, this is a conglomeration of multiple trials showing that only two out of 300 patients had reactivation if they, and this is in, in some high-risk countries, low-risk countries, um, but the reactivation rate was very low. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't watch them, but the, so the rules are you do the tests, you check their LFTs, you monitor their LFTs, you monitor their, and look at their, their viral loads, and the risk should be very low, if not zero. Um, but on the other hand, if you have patients with active infection and you treat, you're going to be in trouble. So these are on top with a number of different patients who have B surface antigen positivity who are treated with different biologics. You can see that two thirds of them had reactivation, whereas those that would actually receive background prophylaxis against hepatitis B, uh, and that could be with butanavir or lamivudine or whatever, none of them reactivated. And that's been shown in multiple studies, and not just in rheumatoid arthritis but in, in, or biologics that we use, but also in cancer. So Lenny and Ken, Ke uh, Kevin Winthrop wrote this good, good review that says screen high-risk patients, our patients. The screen should include surface antigen uh, and core antibodies and follow up with viral DNA loads that you should have extreme caution and not use biologics unless absolutely necessary if someone is B surface antigen positive, and if they, it is necessary, you should get a hepatology consult and use preemptive antiviral prophylaxis. The, um, the resolved infections, I think, can be treated safely, and they should really exercise the same degree of caution for the hepatitis B surface antigen positivity in those individuals who even have more intense forms of immunosuppression, so an RA patient on R drugs who also has cancer and going undergoing radi radiation, that's a different uh, ball of wax. This brings up the issue as to who shouldn't receive a TNF inhibitor, and there are uh, a number of different scenarios. The first one I just told you, B surface antigen positivity. Um, number two, NTM, non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. You can clear TB, but you never clear NTMs. So that's a high-risk person who should not receive a TNF inhibitor. You can go ahead and use abatacept and tocilizumab and other drugs quite safely. Invasive fungal infections, you never fully eradicate them. That's not the oral thrush. That's a, you know, systemic candidiasis, uh, you know, aspergillomas, that sort of thing. And then patients receiving intravesicular BCG or even BCG vaccination are patients who should not be on a TNF inhibitor. Again, you may know the story of the woman who has uh, Crohn's disease, is on infliximab, and, and it delivers a baby. The baby gets vaccinated with BCG and then dies of disseminated infection because the baby had infliximab in its blood from the mother. So the, you know, the whole issue now with pregnancy is when do you stop the TNF inhibitor? Uh, now, we don't use BCG in this country, but rotavirus is a live virus that can be given in the first three months as well. So, but, oh, I should go back. If absolutely necessary, you can actually treat these patients with TNF inhibitors, but you must use back, background prophylaxis. So up here, you would use lamivudine. Over here, you would use um, uh, 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 ZPAC or Zithromax. Over here, you would use, you know, itraconazole, and actually, you wouldn't use it over here at all. So what about TB? Um, I'll, I'll hit a little bit on TB here. Um, I got five minutes. Uh, we actually published a, a, a um, I was part of a group that, that led the studies with Symphony uh, worldwide. And in their development experience with Golimumab, they actually uh, published on these five trials 
three RA trials and uh, 2,200 patients treated with golimumab. And their policy was everybody got a chest X-ray, everybody got a quantifieron, and then they, we, they used local um, uh, measures to screen. So most of them received also a TST test. So with that very intense uh, uh, method of screening, they actually identified fi only five TB cases amongst these 2,000 patients during their 52-week uh, clinical trials. Um, more, and, and, and you can see here that three of them occurred in their er, very early naive patients. Uh, one was in, 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 in a, actually it's four in, in this, and one was in AS. Four were from Asia, two were, two were from, one was from the Ukraine. Um, uh, three out of the five were elderly. Um, and, and so they were in high risk areas. Um, and, and they, again, those patients were all screening test negative. They were test TST negative, they were quantifieron negative. But using that procedure, they did identify 317 individuals who had LTBI, um, and all of them were treated. And you can see that the diagnosis was made either by quantifieron, less greater than 5 millimeters in 254, 215 had a positive TST, and 64 had, were double positive. Of all those pe people who received treatment for LTBI, none of them developed TB during the clinical trial. And of those who received INH amongst this 317, that the incidence of hepatotoxicity was low, but it was greatest, meaning LFT is greater than three times the upper limit of normal. Sorry about that. It was more common when you were on INH and even a little bit more common if you were on background methotrexate. So worldwide, the issue of reinfection while you're on TNF inhibitor directly relates to what your population risk here. That here we have uh, different populations and what their population risk of developing TB, and that's shown the darker your area where you live over here. I live over here, our, our, my population is relatively low. That you can see that in, in this study, patients who converted, they were once negative and became positive, the numbers that go up here, either week 62 or week uh, 110, it is really significant in those who are in the high risk in the areas that have an intermediate and high risk. So if you're on a TNF inhibitor, what is your risk of getting TB again? It's directly proportional to your exposure to TB. That's quite, quite plain and simple. Um, this shows you an important point that, that those of you who are doing TSTs should recognize, that your lowest risk of TB, this is in Spanish for those of you who are puzzling with the words, um, your lowest risk are those who have, again, these low level T, uh, 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 PPD positivity, five millimeters or so. The highest ones are the ones that have greater than 15. The size of the induration, the size of your TST is directly proportional to the, the, the infection. So those of you who are blowing off infections at 15 and 16 millimeters saying it's due to BCG, sorry, Charlie, you're kidding yourself. Because really large B, uh, PPD positivity is almost always going to be infection and not going to be due to BCG. So that's for those of you who are just doing TSTs. NTMs, much more common than, than previously uh, identified. Kevin Winthrop published this. This is the rate of NTMs compared to TB in a population of 30,000 people going on uh, a TNF inhibitor, and that's the popula US population rate. You should suspect this in patients who have recurrent lung-like symptoms, bronchitis, especially in young males. Um, there are eight, the diagnosis can be very difficult because these, these bugs can colonize and not necessarily be active infection. So the ATS, the American Thoracic Society, has uh, rules for doing that. These patients should be PPD negative and they should be IGRA negative, but there are some species of NTMs that will give you positivity using the antigens that are present. That includes Kansasi, Solgai, uh, Flavacins, and Gastri. So this looks at the TB risk. I wanted you to just to see, the, the, the issue often comes up, I have a patient, I'm concerned about TB, what, what biologic should I be using? Well, you shouldn't be using a TNF inhibitor. This is a, a meta-analysis of multiple studies, and you can see that in, in 52 weeks, or the, the, the drug developments part, not the long-term extensions, that it's all the TB cases occur in T, with, with a TNF inhibitor. There was one case in the controls and one case in abatacep, and there's, you know, there's a 75,000 patients tre treated here. So it's, it's, it's TNF inhibitor, TNF inhibitor, TNF inhibitor. If you're concerned about fungal infection or TB, I think you're relatively safe, not 100% safe, relatively safe to use the other drugs, abatacep, tocilizumab, rituximab, and even tofacitinib. But look at the numbers here. The population risk on TB is going down every year in the United States and other developed countries. It's about three to four per 100,000 patient years. This is the, the data from the clinical trials. These rates for drugs that I'm even saying are fairly low, rituximab, abatacep, over here, 20 and 60 
75, for what, what is this, 100, this is a 75 for uh, a, a tocilizumab. The idea here is that it's not as low as it is the population. They're still at higher risk. But if you go on a TNF inhibitor, look at these numbers. They're 300 and 474 per 100,000 patient years. Okay, this is across the board. The numbers really, really go up. So the idea is you really want to avoid TNF inhibitors. You can use the other biologics, but you must maintain some concern. This is from an article written by myself, Kevin, uh, my partner, Dr. Dow, and uh, Dick Chason, a TB maven. One, everybody should be screened. Two, IGR, I, IGRAs are indicated when they're available, when there's a history of BCG vaccination, it should be used. BCG vaccinated individuals should be treated for LTBI um, if they have positive results, because if you, you, most people lose their PPD positivity, and if you're positive, remember you come from a place where TB was endemic, uh, they're much more likely to have infection than BCG-related PPD positivity. Either positivity for BCG or PPD is evidence of infection. PPDs are good for a week or more. You don't, I mean, the optimal read period is 72 hours, but it's good for a week or more. There is poor concordance between the two. Uh, Two-step uh, TSTs are only recommended in healthcare workers in the United States. Outside of the United States, it's often used as a way of, of finding patients who are initially um, negative, maybe due to energy. A chest X-ray is only useful in diagnosing active TB. PPD testing should be repeated. That's in the package insert. Uh, and when should you do it? I do it one year after as a routine and only when the risk changes thereafter. So if their risk changes based on exposure, or, uh, uh, then, then I'll repeat it. Patients with secondary PPDs, they were once negative, now positive, should also have a culture done to exclude active TB, which can certainly be the possibility. Patients with a documented history of adequately treated LTBI or TB can safely receive a TNF inhibitor, and your future risk, as I said, is directly proportional to your exposure risk. And the package insert um, for every drug says the following, preventative anti tuberculosis therapy for patients who have a positive TST or quantiferon. Preventative anti tuberculosis therapy must be initiated before TNF inhibitors. That means if I'm starting you on infliximab and you're PPD positive, I throw INH down your throat and I put the IV in your arm and I've met the letter of the law according to the FDA and CDC. Anybody who's got a policy that's different than that is silly. Okay, and not backed up by any evidence. You may want to wait a month to figure out what the side effects are of INH. That's okay. Uh, the, 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 um, actually, the Dermatology Society says you should wait a year. Actually, you should wait till you complete the course of anti-tuberculous therapy. That's ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous, and not, and not a recommendation of any TB expert in this country. And again, that word before is carefully negotiated by the TB experts and by the CDC, whose biggest division, by the way, is their TB division. Um, maybe now it's the Ebola division, I don't know. Um, but the idea is it, it is okay to do that, uh, and, and you do not have to, have to wait a month, three months, and you're, usually you're getting these answers from people who know less than you, is what I'm saying. Uh, I don't have enough time to cover uh, opportunistic infections other than you should worry about them and the rules still apply. There's a high rate of death with opportunistic infections, often because we don't worry about them. Uh, and again, you're, you're obviously at greater risk if you're from an endemic area. Um, and the FDA has gone so far as to say clinicians should consider uh, initiating empiric antifungal therapy and evaluating at-risk individuals who have undiagnosed systemic illnesses because most of these people who die of fungal infections die without investigation or without any therapy because it was not considered until the autopsy was done. Listeria is in the, you know, Bluebell ice cream is off the shelves and there's bad lettuce and Subway and whatnot, but recognize that the FDA has reviewed this. There are a number of cases of listeria that have been associated with the use of biologics, mostly with infliximab, as you can see here, 77%, um, but etanercept being 11% and golimumab and alimumab being very few, very few cases with the other biologics. Steroids, however, and methotrexate use are commonplace, but that's sort of background therapy. The indications here were mostly rheumatologic, 47% versus IBD, um, and so watch out for listeria. So the best way to avoid infection is to have optimal disease control, employ screening measures uh, where possible, rigorous patient selection. You can know the number by doing that rabbit score, and again, it, it's at Biologica-DE, or what's well, actually on the slide, and it's in the handout that you can find the website. 
avoid or use lower steroids, optimal uh, treatment of comorbidities, uh, communicate infection rules. They, uh, again, the patient should know what the drugs that are most concerning to them. I give my patient very clear rules as to who controls this drug, who stops this drug, and who regulates it. It's me, me, me. Never the surgeon, never the primary care, and never the pharmacist. Caution them about making, uh, taking action based on what they hear on TV or with advertising on TV. Um, there are inappropriate practices we can't get into, and basically the bottom line is know who's at risk. Um, there is a ways of identifying patients and reducing the risk factors um, and then monitoring patients that can really substantially lower one's risk of developing infections. I'll stop there and thank you.